My name is Bob Kerwin, and it gives me great pleasure to welcome you to another special presentation in the True Sport Champions series. True Sport is a national organization that has been created to help sport make a more significant contribution to the positive development of youth, the well being of individuals, and the quality of life in our communities. True Sport is endorsed by the federal, provincial, and territorial ministers of sport and is funded by Sport Canada, the Ontario Trillium Foundation, and a number of other contributors through the True Sport Foundation. My role as a True Sport community animator is to increase the profile of the True Sport movement in Northern Ontario by recognizing the tremendous work that is already being done by individuals, groups, organizations, schools, and municipalities and to offer our assistance in helping you promote the positive values and principles that True Sport is all about. Today I'm pleased to bring you an interview that I had recently with Sam Yanni. Sam is known as Mr. Golf Sudbury because over the years Sam has developed a golf enterprise that includes four golf courses, a retail store, and a training center. You will hear a man who is very passionate about developing junior golf in the Sudbury area. Sam is a CPGA club professional and he shares an awful lot of insight into his feelings about the benefits that young people can achieve by playing golf. The interview takes place in Sam Yanni's clubhouse at Timberwolf Golf Club. Timberwolf is a championship golf course that has hosted three CPGA Tour events in the past. I hope you enjoy the show. Sam has an awful lot to share with us today. So I'm here in uh, the dining room at Timberwolf Golf Course with what many people would uh, refer to as uh, Mr. Sudbury, <laughs> Mr. Golf Sudbury, uh, uh, Sam Yanni. Sam, we're sitting in Timberwolf. Timberwolf is one of your four courses. Yes. And you've been a CPGA golf pro for 39 years. 39 years. 39 years, yeah. And uh, of that 39, will be 34 as a class A, which is a head professional. 34 as a head professional, yeah. I think I can remember when you, when you were at Cedar Green, was that one of your first That places? was my first gig, yes, as a, as a uh, golf professional. I started out on my own in 78 and started work at Cedar Green in September 1st of 1978 and worked there for 11 years as the uh, just the golf professional until we bought the course in 1989. Okay, so one of the reasons why I refer to you as Mr. Golf in the suburb area is you've developed a real golf organization. I think you call it Golf Sudbury? That's correct, yeah. yeah. We banded the four courses and the discount golf super center store into what we call uh, Golf Sudbury, under the Golf Sudbury banner. That's right. Okay. And, and within that within that organization, you've got a, a, a real teaching component as well, because you've got a number of professionals working with you. Yes, we have George Lacko uh, Jr. at uh, Pine Grove. Okay, he's, he's been there for a long time. He's been there for a long time. He's my nephew. Okay. And, uh, he does junior classes out there. His, both his kids now are of junior age, so they're both interested in golf. And he does some clinics out there and, and, and other teaching. And then, of course, we have Tom Clark and Scott Burns here. And Tom and Scott, you know, run a number of junior programs. Uh, before school is out, they run them through week on weekends. And then once school gets out, they run uh, weekly uh, uh, golf camps, they call them. Okay which run from about the 1st of July till school gets back in early September. So and those are quite successful. Okay. So your four courses, uh, before we, we get talking about the juniors, I, I, I want to give people a perspective on, on how different your four courses are. Like without getting into a real long description, can you run through the four courses and, and how you perceive those courses appeal to different kinds of golfers? Sure. Uh, Stonehill, which was our latest acquisition about six years ago, uh, is uh, a short course. It's in some pretty up and down terrain in the rock 
yeah. hills. That's why we call it Stone Hill, of course. Uh, but it's close to the population base, uh, the, where the ki uh, kids on bikes could, you know, get across the highway. I think there's a tunnel uh, or overpass for the kids to get through to get to the golf course, so that they could get there. Uh, it's in the south end of the city. So it's, it's in the south end of the city. Uh, unfortunately, there's no practice facility there. There is a, some putting greens, but um, and it's a. I think the par there is about par 67, 68. It's not a super long golf course, but it's tricky because you really have to place your golf ball on it, otherwise you can lose a lot of golf balls so you have to in be the rocks. Fairly accurate. <laughs> Got to be fairly accurate. accurate, yes. And, and like a mountain goat. And like a mountain goat, yes, especially as you get to the back nine. So, right. Uh, front nine, not as bad, uh, but... Uh, so that's Stonehill. That's Stonehill. Pine Grove, which we picked up, it was our first course we actually picked up in 1983. Uh, originally was a par 35, 36 when we purchased it. Then we purchased some additional land and expanded it to 18 holes. But it's sort of a, what we call an executive course. There are some par 4s and a, one par 5, uh, but a number of par 3s. So the par comes out to 64, which makes it an executive type course. Okay. It's, uh, it's really improved over the years. Uh, it's a fun course. Seniors love to play it, it's not too long. Ladies love to play it, also not too long. It, unfortunately, it's a little bit out of the way for the junior golfer. So uh, for them to uh, get out there, they'd have to be driven out by their parents. So I, I, you know, our junior membership base there, as a result, is uh, sometimes a little bit, uh, a little bit light. So, uh, Cedar Green is the one that we picked up in uh, 1989, so it's been 22 years. And of course, it's right in Garson. And it's always been a very popular golf course. Uh, and, our, uh, and our major uh, acquisition or, or development was, of course, right here at Timberwolf. And uh, it's been open for it's our 13th season now. 13th already? Uh, yes, yeah, I know it's hard to believe the years go by quick. But, uh, and it's got a spectacular practice facility. It's a great place for Tom to do his teaching the junior classes, it's close to uh, residential areas, so it's uh, an all-around uh, you know, great uh, facility for golf. And you built Timberwolf really as a, a championship level course, didn't you? Yes, we did, and we had uh, back when we had some sponsors, we had uh, the Canadian Tour here for three years, and, and they players uh, in particular a lot of the golf course they, they, they thought it was spectacular they thought the practice facility was spectacular so we were very fortunate to to have them here for three years and to get the positive feedback that we had it was uh, was uh, made us feel real good <laughs> well, I, I played on all of the courses and most people in Sudbury have so when you take a look at those four courses you know, Stonehill being kind of rough, rugged, you've got to be pretty accurate, know how to manage your, your, your course, your game. Right. Um, Pine Grove is not quite as long. It's a fun course uh, to play. It, it, it doesn't seem as challenging, but um, I think it actually it is challenging. It is. If you play as of what it is, I mean, we've had, we've had professional pro junior tournaments there the last two years. And the guys loved it, and uh, it's not, not easy to shoot par there. No, it's, it's very difficult because yeah. par threes in, in, in of themselves, if you look at the scoring average on even on the PGA Tour, the easiest scoring holes are the par fives, yeah. then the par fours, and the hardest are the par threes. Yeah. Par threes. So you play a par three course, you know, it's sometimes yeah. can be tricky. Yeah, exactly. And Cedar Green has been the one where uh, it's always packed. Like, people just flock to Cedar Green to play. It's, it's, to me, I, I always found Cedar Green to be a fairly friendly type course where you could have a wayward drive and still have a, a shot at the green. Yes, for sure, especially as you play the back nine. The front nine, there are some holes, uh, you know, one, uh, not so much one, uh, although on the second shot you have to be careful. Two is tight, uh, three is a little bit tricky, as is four, but uh, as you get into the back nine holes, 10, 11, 12, you can pretty well hit it anywhere. Uh, 8 and 13 are pretty wide open, so, uh, and then the par 3s ending up are not too difficult either. Uh, so you've got, you've got such a variety for people to go for. So, so let's, that's where we are today. Let's go back because 
Um, I think both of us started golfing uh, around the same age. I started golfing when I was about 11, you know, 50 years ago when they first opened live because it was right on our backyard. You started golfing when you were 10 or 11? Well, actually even a little bit before then. Um, I mean, I started golfing, I wouldn't use the word seriously, but I started playing, uh, when I turned 10, I started caddying at the Ottawa. I grew up just down the street from the Ottawa. So when I was 10, they, we were given the, uh, uh, as caddies, we were allowed to play Mondays and Friday mornings if we teed off before 7 a.m. So that's when my serious were actually could play a golf course. Before then, uh, in our backyard in Walford Grove, we had a large field. And we designed our own little golf course back there, dug holes with clubs and had a little, you know, uh, I forget how many holes, five or six holes that we chipped to from, from into people's backyards and around the, around the area. We had a little driving range where we hit balls across the street where now Laurentian Hospital lives. I'm sure there's still some golf balls in, in the parking, under the parking lot there somewhere. And, uh, and of course in the, in the, in the backyard, uh, we did a lot of chipping in that. So golf was in our blood from a very early age. Largely because we grew up in that atmosphere. Caddying was very big back then. I'm talking early, early mid '60s. You know, Cad golf carts weren't as prevalent as they are today, and everybody, everybody took a caddy. So it was a, it was a, it was a job. You know, this is where we made money. And, uh, and then as we caddied, we we learned the sport and, and got to enjoy it. And the Iowa was. Private golf course too. Yes, at the time, uh, and still is a, a private course. Yeah. So, so it's really not a lot different from people growing up playing hockey, where they started off playing on frozen rinks. Exactly. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's kind of like you just yeah. don't know how fun. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Play uh, uh, the score is the score. It's not yeah. not competitive. So, so, so it kind of. It doesn't really matter what sport it is. It almost seems as if when you start off, you're really just having fun. Exactly. And, and yeah. it's pretty crude. It's yeah. nowhere like the kind of facilities that you've got here at Timberwolves or, or at the Ottawa. So as you were a junior, what can you remember as a, being a junior golfer, playing golf? Like well, just having years? the uh, uh, ability to play a golf course on a regular basis. What had happened was, again, I was a caddy for three, four years and, and only allowed to play Mondays and Friday mornings before 7 a.m. That doesn't allow you a lot of golf time. No. And uh, I didn't play a lot of other golf courses. But what happened in 67, I got a job in the back shop cleaning golf clubs. And with that, I was allowed to play as a junior member of the Idlewild. Okay. Well, I come from very, uh, very large family, very humble beginnings, and uh, there's no way my parents were golfers and uh, knew nothing about the sport, so there's no way they, you know, I could afford it to get a membership or play the Idlewild unless I was able to get a job there. And once I got a job cleaning clubs, it allowed me to be a, a junior member at the Idlewild and allowed me to, to uh, play golf on a regular basis. And that's where I really you know, exploded in terms of the excitement and the playing. And, and then uh, I played every opportunity I had when I wasn't working. Uh, under the junior hours that, that were set out, right. And uh, when it, and the first tournament I actually ever played was was uh, when I was 17. I played in the Northern Ontario Junior, which was at the Idlewild. <laughs> and I remember asking uh, um, at the time uh, there was a Dr. Crane who was still alive. Actually, okay. I still remember asking him uh, when I was 17 years old if I could play in the, in the junior tournament. I wasn't sure if I'd be even allowed. Because I wasn't a member, really. I was just a, I was an employee, yeah. and he allowed me. And I finished third in the tournament, and I was pretty excited about that. And then the next year it was in the Suga Country Club, and I went again, and I won it, and uh, I was very excited about that. And then at the time, I'd never been to Toronto in my life, and, and uh, I was able to go down to Toronto to play in the Ontario Juniors. And this is in 1970 and 1971, so it was my first time out of the city of summer, really. So, so how did you get that good? Just from playing, did you have coaches? I'm not really. I was mostly self-taught. Uh, like a lot of other players, I had this uh, book, uh, Ben Hogan book, the Five Mon Five Modern Fundamentals of Golf, okay. and I studied that book and read that book, and then I went out and practiced and practiced and practiced, and um, I got a little bit of coaching along the way from Carl Van Stone, who was the pro at the time, and. Uh, 
you know, just you know, it just it just play, you know, and play and play and play and practice. I mean, there's no end to how good you forget. get. See, I can remember going back to when they started lively in our backyard, and back in those days, like my first set of clubs was they were made out of wood. Yep. And and uh, wood shafts or wood shafts? Wood shafts. shafts. Oh really? Well that's going back. That's going back. <laughs> and and they were you given must be much older than me. <laughs> well they, yeah, yeah. Much they were given to us by, by my uncle from Toronto who had never used them. Yeah. So he had had them for quite a while. And what I can remember back in the sixties was that there was there was more of a predominance of junior golfers. At our course, our course was a public, public course and brand new course in right. a town where really golf was not all that popular. Right. So we had no trouble getting on the course. Right. We would play before school, after school. Yeah. Uh, Wayne uh, is still a CBGA uh, member. Uh, we would go out after dark when the moon was up, and we would actually putt on the green. Right. Because you could see, we, we would chip and putt. Till midnight. It was like yeah. y you lived, you lived it, and you had no trouble going out. And there were a lot of your friends went golfing, so there was nothing to, to go out with for some. Right. But what I found when my own kids started playing golf in the uh, in the eighties, the late eighties, I, I started to find that there wasn't there wasn't that great a, 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 a number of junior golfers on yeah. courses. Yeah. It almost seemed as if uh, when you went out when I started, it, it, and it would probably be a little different at the Idaho because it, the Idaho was a private course, but but I can remember at the public course, junior golfers all over the place. And gradually over the years, very few junior golfers are seen, and very few are seen in foursomes. Right. And, and yet, when we were 10, 11, 12, there were lots of 10, 11, 12 year olds playing the course. 